Hello friends, today we are in conversation with Tetet Loren, advisor at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Climate Justice Program Office in Manila. And she is a long time passionate campaigner for climate justice and sustainable development. And for me, she is a storehouse of energy. Just looking at her, I get energized and very optimistic. Uh, Tetet, uh, can you please share with us the significance of holding this first ever conference on uh, climate, uh, the, the rights of climate migrants in Philippines? Mm -hmm. Well, you do know that um, the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change. And um, everywhere we've heard stories, powerful stories from the survivors themselves of how five years after Super Typhoon Haiyan, people are still living in makeshift tents, people still have no livelihood, you know, there is really evidence of government neglect. On the other hand, because of Super Typhoon Haiyan, there was massive international humanitarian relief. You know, we were having problems absorbing uh, so, much so much relief in. coming from the international community but these were not directly c going to the people it was lining the pockets of corrupt politicians corrupt businessmen so you know um, the struggle continues the the hardships continue so everyone says climate migration is becoming a big problem and it will increase in the future but no one is actually taking accountability what now happens to the climate migrants after the relief has gone? Uh, that, that one thing which really impressed me in this conference was this amazing partnership between global, regional, local organizations and community groups as well. And it must have been a challenge working with such a diverse group of people. So can you share your insights? into how to build effective partnerships with so many gr different uh, groups so that this model can be replicated elsewhere because I think that is very important and uh, very often we keep on working in silos when there is so much of interlinkage between issues not only of uh, climate migrants but other issues as well. Yeah, it's a good thing that Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung works on a broad range of issues, no? Because we advocate for global social rights. So we are very strong on the social justice component, economic justice component, climate justice. So that now allows us and gives us the privilege of working in many different streams, uh, in different platforms. So um, we've already made those connections and having the other co-organizers from different uh, communities, you know, like we, we try to bring the migrants in, we try to bring the climate folks in, we try to bring the development folks in, because you're right, no? We're not supposed to be working in silos. We're supposed to be breaking down those silos. And I think that's one of the things that I appreciate most about this conference is that we try to bring the different communities together in a common conversation. And it's been amazing because um, it feels like, you know, one struggle, many fronts. We're all here for the comprehensive restructuring of our societies, of our economies, but there are some specificities, no? What are migrants' issues? What are climate issues? But together we were able to bring them, and it's, it's coherent, no? <laughs> it's chaotic, but it's coherent. I think you're being too modest at it, because surely there must have been challenges, and I would could you share some of them so that others who want to follow the same model they have to keep those things in mind mm -hmm. so. it is one big challenge because if you're familiar with um, how Philippine so civil society is uh, organized mm -hmm. you know we have many leftist tra leftist traditions mm -hmm. so just like in India yes, yes. Um, they don't always talk to each other. Mm -hmm. They might be saying the same thing, but they don't always talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And there's always that sort of tension and competition, which group, which tradition is the, uh, has the right line. 
<laughs> so we tried to, knowing all of those dynamics, we still try to reach out to them and you know present them the concept of coming together of the different actors, because uh, it's one common concern. So they said yes, but you know we were approaching things with caution. So everything had to be collectively discussed between the co-organizers. Uh, everything had to be collectively decided. You know, there were some hiccups, there were some bumps along the way, like some are because of so many things to do. So some are more responsive than the others. But you know, you just don't give up. You're, we're, we're organizers. And I think the process of putting this conference together was also a learning curve for all of us. Um, I think it helps that um, we know them personally, we've worked with uh, them at different points in time, so there is already that commonality. And of course, you know, um, if you want to move things forward, you don't burn bridges. Because there were some times that, oh my gosh, they're not answering my emails, they're not uh, re replying, so you just persist and then inject good humor. There was even one time when they were not responding to my email. So I said, I'm resending this email just in case you ignored me. <laughs> and then suddenly... <laughs> you have that knack. <laughs> and then suddenly they all responded. So it's like, okay, you know. Um, we understand that there's so many things to do. Sometimes one takes priority than the other. But I, we do believe that once people have the ownership of the process, of the activity, then we will see it through. You know, I think yes. that is key, ownership. Rosa Luxemburg did not come there and offer them the conference ready-made. We said, we are not experts on migration. We may have some expertise on some social issues, but, you know, we also want to learn from each other. So we all came to the same table without any pretensions, pretenses that we were experts in, in climate migration. So I think it's that spirit of openness and willingness to learn from each other that made this conference possible. And it was also amazing to see the trust which the local organizations had with the communities. Means the community visits have been an eye-opener for I think many of us. We think of it, we talk of it, at home on paper but seeing is believing and seeing makes you hum it is a very humbling experience and the sort of trust we saw between the communities and the organ the local organizations who were working for them that was amazing thank you very much <laughs> uh, I did now at least after so many years it has become evident that climate change is affecting each and every facet of our lives we took a long time to understand perhaps we are still not acting in the <laughs> right direction, but that is that is an evident fact. Uh, what is uh, the strategic importance of focusing on climate-induced migration per se? Means that that is one way uh, climate change is affecting us. Mm -hmm. So, what is the strategic importance of this? I think climate migration as a topic. You know, it's like the pink elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Everybody says it's important. Everybody says we need to address it. Everyone says um, we need to act on, on the issue because it's, it's here, it's happening, but it's going to get bigger in the future with increasing impacts of climate change, both slow onset, you know, the drought, salinity, things that happen over a longer period of time, and also because of the disasters, the, the sudden onset things. I think for the sudden onset things, uh, humanitarian response has always been the go-to. It's the default mode of the international community. But as we've heard from the conference, humanitarian response also has its limits. You know, there, there can be such a thing as donor fatigue because, you know, we, we move from one disaster to the next. So while humanitarian response is still important, it's still relevant, it's not enough to bring us to answering the difficult questions of why are people, why are poor people more vulnerable in the first place? You know, we've heard uh, from the conference that Japan, for instance, yes, yes. Many natural, many disasters, many problems, nuclear, yes, you know, yes, yes, but, but 
Japanese people are not migrating in massive numbers. So there must be something within the Japanese economy and the way the Japanese society and government is organized that gives support to these people should such disasters and other occurrences happen, which is we don't find those things in our countries. Yes. That's why for us, the mode is people are forced to move away from their original communities. So, you know, these are difficult questions that we may not have the answers to right now. But the conference helped us to formulate those questions so that we can also try to um, think among ourselves, how do we now seek the answers to those questions? Because sometimes I think that uh, a lot many disasters which we call natural disasters, there is a lot of human hand behind them. In, in India we have been having uh, massive landslides in the mountains. That is because of so much of construction going on, five stars hotels being built on top of mountains, which is weakening that whole layer. So that landslide is not actually a natural disaster. It is, And elsewhere also there are... Uh, so many cases where we are tampering with nature so much that uh, those disasters or even say drought uh, and floods uh, it, floods are not just nat uh, natural or uh, made in heaven and coming to us uh, another question which comes to my mind that it is the UNFCCC has been there for quite some time and still We've been have we have had oil companies sponsoring events around climate uh, discourses. So, do you see any hope when governments would at least stop kick them out, like we had in the F we have in the FCTC? There is an article which says that um, these tobacco companies cannot sit across the table to discuss health uh, policies. And so, do you see any hope for governments to at least? kick big polluters out of these discourses because otherwise will it actually be meaningful I'm so glad you raised that point <clears throat> because we have been pushing for a conflict of interest policy within the UN climate uh, convention um, unfortunately um, it hasn't gone it hasn't progressed so much no, um, the most that we got was to try to create some noise around it and there were some governments also coming from developing countries who were with civil society trying to push for a conflict of interest policy because yes. as you said, we can't have oil companies, we can't have fossil fuel companies negotiating about climate policy because there's a fundamental conflict of interest. No? It doesn't take a genius to realize that fossil fuel companies will never uh, push for laws that would regulate their uh, profit-seeking activities. You know, everyone knows that. It's fundamental. But uh, more and more, we see that big countries, uh, of course, supported by a strong fossil fuel lobby, are effectively blocking any meaningful discussion on a conflict of interest policy. So the tobacco case has been cited very often already as an example of, you know, why there is there needs to be a conflict of interest policy. But we're not seeing that happening in the UNFCCC. So the the powerful lobby of um, fossil fuel um, industry is really you know controlling that's why we're saying uh, there is clearly the corporate capture of this space of this UN space no yeah so I think we we need to take the battle elsewhere if we cannot get results from this UN bodies then we need to hit the fossil fuel industry where it hurts the most cut the finance pipeline <coughs> Who will cut it? Who will? At least we can try for it. That's all. That's it. Uh, what uh, strategic potential do, do you see in the Manila Initiative, and how can it be fully leveraged by different groups to address the issue of climate-induced migration? Um, yes, we're super excited that we adopted the Manila Initiative on the rights of climate migrants. Um, we feel that it's got a lot of potential in terms of uh, providing us, you know, the framework. How do we um, view the problem of climate migration? Uh, it gives us 
guidance on what are some possible, you know, the analysis, why things are happening, why poor people are forced to migration. And uh, uh, guidance also in terms of what policy asks or demands we should be asking from governments, from other actors. But it also serves to unite us. Yes. You know, more than anything else, I am so excited that the Manila Initiative is there uniting all of us in civil society, in social movements. And uh, because it's an initiative, yes. it's not set in stone, mm -hmm. we can use it in any way that we see it that would advance either our advocacy work, our engagement, our campaigning, and our mobilizing. So it's got a lot of potential on because it's um it's broad it's political but it also allows organizations and individuals that flexibility to use it as a tool you know it's not a declaration yes, yeah. that uh, people feel that they are tied to yes. <laughs> implement things to the letter but this is something that is open and broad that allows us to use it harness its potential um, in the particular context that we may find ourselves working in. So I think, you know, people don't like to be constrained because the environment that we work with is already so restrictive. But we want some guidance, some tools, and that we can use uh, flexibly in our campaigning. Anything else you would like to share? I've had my fill of the questions, but anything besides this you would like to share? I would like to thank the CNS team from the bottom of our hearts. No? Um, you were here as participants, and of course you have a lot of great contributions, but you were more than just participants. We feel that you were part of the RLS team and the co-organizers helping us spread the word around to a much larger audience. So the amazing reportage that you were doing, um, tweeting, Everything, even these interviews, pre-conference, during conference, post-conference, we could not uh, imagine ourselves being able to, you know, we don't have that capacity. But because of the work of CNS, you, you made things happen for us also. So thank you so much. We are all in the fight together. <laughs> that, that, that is important. And, and you have brought us together <laughs> to be on the same platform. <laughs> Friends, we were listening to this very, very inspiring conversation with Tetet Lauren, who is advisor at the Rosa Luxemburg Climate Justice uh, Program Office in Manila. Thank you, Tetet. Thank you.